Thank you for downloading Season 5, Episode 19 of Baseball Pitching the Fix. I am your host, Joe Janish. And with me, as always, is baseball pitching motion expert, Angel Borelli. And we are, again, this is Season 5, Episode 19. Thank you so much for hanging with us through the winter. Uh, This is the first of two preseason shows we will be publishing in February. So buckle up. We're going to learn a few excellent things today. Today we have a mechanical question about the rear leg from one of the coaches. And then we will be going into our coaching the coaches segment, talking about the art of the bullpen and how you can get the most out of a bullpen session. So without further ado, we bring on the expert. Angel, how are you doing out there in California? Well, I think I'm doing better than you. I hear tiny icicles coming off of your voice. Am I right (laughs) about that? Yeah, I actually may sound a little jacked up because I've drank about six cups of coffee just to warm up. And, uh, <laughs> how but, cold you know, is it in New? How cold is it there in New York? Uh, right now, it's about six degrees. I uh, but I can't complain because I know there are a lot of folks out in Chicago and up in Minnesota and other parts of the country that are way below zero. So I yeah, I can't complain too much. I'll just bundle up and smile. And being from Chicago, this is why I moved to California. The last winter I moved, I couldn't deal with another winter. It gets really cold there. So anyway, well, we're glad you're warm and okay. And so anyway, I'm excited about today's show because it's so, we're getting so close to the season. I can't believe it's almost here. I know. Well, I, I have a hard time believing that pitchers and catchers are reporting in two weeks with uh, with the way the weather is, but I guess that's because they're in Florida and Arizona. So Exactly. <laughs> Yes. So but, that's great. Yeah. In any case, so we have more feedback from our listeners. So Angel, why don't you tell us about the question that you received from, was it Coach Steve? Yes, it was Steve down in Southern California. And he wrote me uh, with a question, a mechanical question. He does do video. He's trying to learn how to look at video and look at things. So, and I, I want to actually read his exact part of his email because I think that in addition to giving the information about what he asked, which is about the rear leg, there were a few things that he said in it that made me realize that, you know, some important service that I want to eventually give coaches one day is really how to look at video and how to think of the way the parts go together. So let me read. So first of all, he was doing a video on one of his sophomore pitchers. And he said, after reviewing the bullpen video, He is finishing low with his pivot leg. So he calls the rear leg the pivot leg. He's a right-handed pitcher, so it's his right leg. Actually, the knee is ending up low and driving towards the plate. He finishes kind of hunkered over, bent at the waist. A lot of pitches were up, so we worked on finishing the leg high and immediately he was spotting pitches back down in the zone. He said, so I guess my question is, would you comment on the importance of the pivot leg and how it should move as a counterbalance to the glove and the throwing arm? I love this question because, you know, I always, of course, want to be able to provide the information that coaches ask for, But I think the language that baseball uses for so many things is so interesting to me. Being a scientist, words are everything. But sometimes the way a coach asks a question reflects to me how way back when pitching coaches were, and you guys still have this role of trying to deal with the motion, you see something, you think you know what it's doing. You give it a name, it's got a name, it's you know been passed on for 50 years. And really and truly, it's not really a name that's actually accurate if you look at the words. And then at the same token, but it's, it's the way it's thought about. So when we see pitchers, when I see pitchers making certain errors, I almost can tell what he was told to do or how he was told to do something. And this is just a reference to It is definitely not a criticism of any coach or the language you use, but it's a reference to how complicated the pitching motion is and how happy I am to be able to provide some tiny details that even by changing your language, a pitcher may know, have a better sense of how he has to do something. So for example, let's talk about the rear leg. The rear leg gets more pitchers in trouble 
It's the only leg on the ground. Most errors in the pitching motion, you've heard me say, occur before the front leg touches. So he's only on his rear leg. That's why if you think the front leg is doing anything, it w- whatever the front leg does is a response to the way the rear leg works. So let's all make sure we get that straight. Secondly, the leg doesn't, the, the stride motion, which is initiated by the hip, the side of the hip on that right leg for a right-handed pitcher, that hip is moving the body sideways. The term pivot leg indicates that that leg is pivoting off the rubber, which is what this pitcher actually was doing. So what you see pitchers do is they start to turn their knee inward, which causes a pivoting on the back leg. And the minute that knee is the first thing that moves, the muscle on the side of the hip is actually not able to move the body correctly sideways. So you get a leg because the knee was the first thing that moved and it turned inward. You get a leg that isn't able to move sideways. It isn't, doesn't have much strength and it ends up collapsing too close to the ground, which is what Steve was actually seeing a collapsing of the back leg. That's why he was talking about the knee was low. Okay. So let's talk about this again. So whenever your knee turns inward, that's actually not the knee turning inward. Your hip is turning inward. The knee doesn't have any ability to rotate. It only, it's a hinge joint, just like your elbow. Your elbow only goes one way, two ways, open and closed, flexed and extended. Same thing with the knee joint. So When you see the knee turning inward and the pitcher is thinking that's the way he gets to the front leg by turning that knee inward, he's really turning the hip inward. So if the hip's turning inward, it can't really also do the other function of moving you sideways. You've got other muscles doing it. So what you get is a back leg that's not moving efficiently. Always remember the position of that back leg should look like the outside of a triangle. When you're standing in front of the stride, the pitcher and he's striding, you want to teach him to ride, that's R-I-D-E, ride the inside of his back leg, which is lengthening the back leg so that he pretty much is forming like that leg that, you know, I always say when a jumping jack, when you land, it's got that, that look. And when he's using the side hip to do that, You'll see the foot staying stable next to the rubber, the body moves sideways, and then just as the foot lands, then the foot does what you might call a pivot, but pivot's not actually a great word because it causes pivoting too soon. Then the weight goes into the ball of the foot, and then that rear leg helps turn the pelvis. So the back leg is becoming the structure that is supporting the sideways movement then when it turns and it remains on the ground during the turning, and especially once the pitcher has totally squared up to the plate, it now becomes a stabilizing factor to the body as it's leaning forward to deliver the ball. And when it runs out of real estate, because you're reaching out to accelerate the ball, the leg comes up into a follow through. So everything that's happening with that back leg is it's the moving force sideways. It turns the back part, the right side of the body to square up. And then it stabilizes as the pitcher starting to accelerate the ball. And then the leg comes up. So that is how important that rear leg is. Now, what he saw was, okay, the knee's low to the ground. And he also commented on, and his back was all, And he said, hunkered over. And I know exactly what it looks like. And here's the deal. If the back leg starts pulling downward, the minute a body part goes down, it, the body can't move forward. In other words, the back leg is like holding him back. So we never really got his body weight committed to the front leg. So there he is. He's almost stopping. And I know exactly what this looks like. And when his arm delivered the ball, I'm sure it looked from the side like he was sitting in a chair where his butt's behind him, his legs in front, his thigh is almost parallel to the ground. 
This is because the rear leg didn't come off the rubber correctly. It turned. It was trying to turn when it was going sideways. Therefore, you couldn't move your center of mass far enough out. And you had to, you had to end up where you were. And because of the knees pulling you down to the ground, the front leg's going to go down too. Now the only thing you've got left is some arm. So that's the deal with the rear leg. And Steve, that's a great eye that you saw that. Now, the other comment you made, and I want all you coaches to remember this, if the pitcher is down, the ball will be up. If the pitcher is up, the ball will be down. (laughs) It's just as simple as that. You're coming under the ball. When the legs are down and they're collapsed, you're rotating with your trunk in such a way that you're going to come under the ball. You'll see your off speed not working. The sliders definitely don't work. And a lot of times when you've got pitchers that throw great pitches and all of a sudden they go awry, especially a slider, I can say this for sure, take a look to make sure that he's not collapsing in any way. And yes, Steve, you're right. When you brought him up, you actually worked with him to keep his back leg up. That was great. You also can give the cue, land with the front leg that's higher. That cue makes him almost indirectly wor- uh, work a little better with the back leg. So either one is good, but you're absolutely right. When a pitcher is sinking down, he can't get behind the ball in the same way. He ends up under it. So it either shoots in the air like a volleyball serve or he's under the ball. And who knows what it's going to do depending on what pitch he's throwing. So yes, when you're when he's down, it's up. When he's up, it's down. And that's kind of a simple thing to kind of, it's a troubleshooting tip, something we know when, you know, when you look at video all day, you figure these things out. So did Joe, do you, do you think I answered that question clearly enough for everybody to understand? Did you get it? I I did get it. I I'm, I'm visualizing what I'm visualizing in my head is something that I've mentioned before and our listeners will probably think I'm a broken record here, but I, um, I keep thinking back to the old Tom Seaver right. and Jerry Kuzman's of the Mets when, and this whole theory that you're supposed to drop and drive. And mm-hmm. I think that maybe some pitchers may think they need to do that. And in trying to turn their, their motion into a picture of Tom Seaver with his back leg all the way down, you know, I could see where they might, mm-hmm. you know, turn their foot early when they're not supposed to and, you know, drop that back knee down. And, and, and this also goes back to our episode about pushing off the rubber. I mean, there's, you know, you, you don't push off the rubber. And if a pitcher thinks that that's what they're supposed to do, they might, they might think, well, there's the only way I can really, I can't push sideways off the rubber. So I'll mm-hmm. turn my foot and try to push against it with the ball. In my foot. I don't know, but I've, I've definitely seen similar issues as well. And I, the way you were describing it, it, makes sense to me. So thank you. Well, so, and and so the thing is, and and more recently, a pitcher that I can uh, talk about, remember Tim Hudson from the A's, he had, he had this totally long stride with his back leg almost down. And I used to be at a lot of those games because I happened to be working with a pitcher on the team. And so I was at a lot of the games and I remember thinking, this guy's going to have a hip injury. And sure enough, a hip injury, just like Tim Lincecum, this guy's going to have a hip injury. When you create an artificial length to your stride, you're going to have problems eventually. If you create an artificial length by rushing off the mound, trying to push as hard as you can, and then your foot has to pull off because your front leg landed so far down. Well, you've got an artificial length. You're going to have trouble rotating because you're not really stable when you get to the front leg. If you ch- use your back leg kind of incorrectly and you start to lower and turn the knee in, and then the knee, because it's bent, thinks you're going down, it's going to pull you down. Now you've got an artificial length of a stride that's not only not long enough. Well, sometimes it might be the right length, but it's not positioned. Your body's not positioned over it because you're sitting down on the ground. And I call it sitting in a chair because that's what they look like. They look like the knees front, the, the front leg is vertical, the lower leg, and you can see the thigh and their butts way behind the thigh, just like it is when you're sitting in a chair. No, you're supposed to be up and over that front leg. So artificial lengths to strides, you have to be careful. They're not good in either way, whether it's too long or too short. 
the hips take a beating and the arm takes a beating because if you're not committed to the front leg, you can't rotate correctly. You're trying to get behind the ball to accelerate it. Remember, guys, our pitchers get their jobs done. They're going to get it done no matter how they're going to do it. That's why we want to help them do it right because they're going to try to do it any way they can. And sometimes it's, it can be so inefficient that it can hurt them. So anyway, well, cool. So Steve, thanks so much. And coaches, you know, I'm always here for you. So write in with any great questions that you have. I keep the questions coming. Yeah, that was a, that was a really good question. So we're going to move on to our coaching the coaches segment. And, you know, Angel, I don't think there's anyone else who spends more time running bullpens than you. So I, I imagine you would be the person to ask, how can a coach and a pitcher get the most out of a bullpen? Well, you know, you're absolutely right. I'm kind of a bullpen coach, aren't I? Pretty much. I know. I was thinking about it the other day. In fact, that's why I thought this topic is so important because so everybody I work, uh, I use a, a mound on a high school field. They have uh, two bullpens, one in the right field, one in left field, way out. There's two mounds on each one of the bullpens. So we got one big dirt mound with two rubbers. They're spaced apart well so that two pitchers are sometimes working. So I'm, when I'm out there, there's either the practices of the high school. There's also travel teams that the coaches run. And there's also, you know, summer ball and everything else. Sometimes there's scrimmages going on. So there's situations where the coach sends over a pitcher and it's for, you know, go get ready to come in. So I'm working with my client, but you know, you know how us coaches are. We have eyes all around our head and you can't help but notice things. And I see more errors in the bullpen the way that pitchers run them, the way they use them. And I said, you know what, if this is a, this is an area that needs to be discussed. I don't ever think I hear people talk about the importance of a soft side, a hard side, how you run it, how you're going to do it when it's high pitch count. What do you do when it's low pitch count? Also the relevance of that bullpen, everyone just thinks, oh, I'm going to get warmed up. It's so much more than that. And the reason why I know that is because, of course, I'm working in a bullpen setting with my pitchers where we're always following some pitch count. We are always doing something within that framework. And each bullpen has possibly different goals, different objectives. But I have to glean as much out of that bullpen as possible and have various objectives because here I am working with pitchers. And if it's just instructional and we're not also incorporating things that actually go on for him within his skill when he's on a team, I'm kind of wasting time. So what I did is I learned how to always incorporate a lot of objectives. Now, one of the things that I ask my pitchers when they come to me, I have to ask them a lot of questions. I do. I'm like a a detective. I'm kind of an investigator because you can get so much information from a pitcher that can lead to the answer uh, quick, more quickly as to what's going on. And remember, except for the, well, even the injured pitcher, every pitcher that comes to me, it's something about performance. So what I did is I kind of came up with some questions that are the ones that give the most information to me that bounce back to something they're not doing in their bullpen. So I have some ideas. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And then coaches, I'm going to give you some more tips. And many of you may already be doing all the things I'm talking about because I know I deal with really, really good coaches. And there's a lot of you coaches that are just starting. And there's a lot of you fathers that are out there trying to be a coach for your son's team. So these, hopefully you'll get one little tip that will help make things better. So, and remember, everything we're doing in a bullpen has to do with the performance in the game. So if there's anything that you might be missing and, you know, you're focused on some of the obvious details in a game you might be able to start incorporating better bullpens to get better results. So I want you in your heads to be running through thinking of pitchers where what I'm going to say might apply. 
So let's just talk first about one of the things that I think is so important. Every pitcher needs to know how many pitches it takes for him to warm up. And we'll talk about what that warm up should be, but he needs to know his number. And out here, you know, I started with little kids doing this and my older guys still call it that, their magic number. A pitcher needs to know what his number is. And it's so important. And I guarantee you, if you stand up, you call your pitching staff over for a little meeting and you go around and say, what, what, how many pitches do you need to get warmed up? Uh, I don't know. Uh, well, whatever I can get, you'll get that answer. You'll get a starter, especially a younger one saying, um, 15, 10, eight, no way. So knowing their number and of course, listening to it and saying, no, you're not warmed up. You can't be warmed up. The purpose of the bullpen has, there's many things that need to happen in the bullpen. And let's talk about the bullpens before a game. And let's talk about the bullpens as practice. A pitcher has to, in the bullpen, on a physical level, he has to get his chemistry going. That's particularly if it's before a game. He's got to somehow start to turn on his lights. He's not going to do it in a technical bullpen. So we'll call the pens between performance as technical bullpens. But he's got to get his chemistry going. To do that, he's got to get some heat going. So he has to be in that bullpen for a certain number of pitches. Let's talk about starters. Okay, let's not talk about closers right now. They're a different animal, and it'll be easier to relate to closers when we get this discussion done. So The other thing we want them to do, in in addition to the physical qualities they need, is they need to find their release point on all their pitches. Now, I have a rule with my guys because it's something I evolved over time and also with watching what coaches do way back when I knew nothing about pitching. My pitchers throw 12 fastballs before they throw anything else. That way I know they've created the most amount of heat in, in the tissues and they've not put their forearm into any rotational sorts of things. So we do 12 pitches. This is after, of course, they've done flat ground. Then they start working in change-ups and their off-speed. And I never call it. I mean, first of all, I don't want to ever look like I'm trying to be a pitching coach. But I always let them do it at their own timing because they know when it's time to throw something. So they've got to find their release point. Most pitchers have at least three pitches, if not four or five. You can't find your release point if you're waiting till 12 to do something. You can't find your release point if you're only throwing 15 pitches. So one of the questions I ask pitchers when they come in, as I say, how many pitches do you normally throw to warm up? And then depending on their answer, I know, am I dealing with someone who knows what he's doing in a bullpen or not? The second question I ask, particularly of the guy who gives me an answer that makes me go, hmm. And by the way, I have already asked him, what types of pitches do you throw? The first questions I ask every pitcher are, are you righty or lefty? Do you swing a bat? Is that righty or lefty? And what types of pitches do you throw? And it's to the detail. If it's a changeup, what kind of changeup? So you really know. So he's telling you he's got four pitches. He's a starter. Of course, I'm asking his role. So he says, oh, uh, let's see, 12 pitches, 15 pitches. I go, oh, okay. So tell me about your games. Tell me, like, what's your best inning? I mean, like, you know, how's your first inning? Terrible. I'm usually good. I really am good in the third and fourth inning. Boom. The first inning, he's still warming up. And this is one of the biggest problems I see in high school games. The pitcher going in and he has a rough first inning because he didn't throw enough pitches in his bullpen. It always correlates like 90% of the time. So coaches, right now, when you're thinking about your returning pitchers, think about the way you think about them. Oh boy, he always has a rough first inning. Or no, he's always spot on in the first inning. The first inning lets you know if he threw a good bullpen. Maybe you say, you know, he's great in the first inning, but he can't locate his curveball till about the fourth inning, so I don't even call it anymore. When you 
see performance things that are a pattern. And it has to do with timing of the innings. Go back and talk to these pitchers and ask them specifically what they're doing in their bullpens, because that is the key. Pitchers need first innings that are great. Just like we all know the first pitch strike is so important. The first inning is important. And there are many pitchers that have a pattern. In fact, the father will say, oh, he's so bad in the first inning. I like suffer. That tells me he's not doing something right in his bullpen. He couldn't be unless he's got some type of nervousness or whatever when he takes the mound. But you see, when you're working your body and heating it up, that starts to help to dissipate that excitement. So the worst thing, the most awful thing that can happen is for a pitcher who has a pattern of a first inning failure all the time is for you not to look at what he's doing in his bullpen. That's kind of cool to be able to make that connection, isn't it, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've I've definitely seen that with pitchers at every level, right up through the the big leagues. They just don't know how to uh, get themselves warmed up and to the point where uh, they say they're trying to save themselves for the game. They don't want to waste any energy in the bullpen. Well, you know, every pitcher does know how to modulate his energy, but he still has to be and you and you're not going to see a pitcher hit his velocity. That's why coaches do not put do not put guns on your pitchers in bullpens. If you need to know the number, take it in a game because the number is a nightmare for them. They they don't go, "Oh, I'm I'm at 87. Geez, I'm usually in low 90s." No, a pitcher who's in the low 90s, I mean, he he might be 87 in a bullpen. The chemistry is everything. So that's why I never work with a gun. But again, and we've talked about this on shows, my catcher's telling me he's throwing hard. And and of course, he's making qualitative judgments. He's throwing harder than the last bullpen. And guess what? The pitchers themselves know, are they happy with the velocity on that ball? But showing them a gun with numbers that don't look right creates nightmares. So anyway, yes. So each pitcher knows how to do that, but they have to have effective bullpens. The biggest mistakes I see in high school and in travel ball, when the coaches are running a game and coaches, you can't be down there watching them all the time. I know that if it's in a practice session, you might send a pitching coach with six of your pitchers, but they very frequently are there throwing bullpens without anybody watching them. So here's some of the errors that I see, particularly in youth baseball. I'll see two kids come running up to the mound. He's getting ready to go in. The kid that is with the pitcher has no equipment on. He's not really a catcher, and he doesn't even get down. That's one error I see. Believe it or not, the pitcher, the person catching him is not even down. He doesn't even look like a catcher. If a pitcher is pitching to a kid without equipment on, that pitcher is holding back. If he's holding back, he's not getting warmed up. So I want you to think about that. Second problem I see, not enough pitches because the pitcher is rushing because the coach didn't tell him to warm up soon enough, or he thinks he's ready in eight pitches. And I might see those eight pitches where the ball's going over the catcher's head. In other words, there's no self-correcting going on. There's not the conversation the pitcher should be having with himself, which is, whoa, I'm not keeping the ball down. Sometimes pitchers think, well, I'm not keeping the ball down here, but I'll keep it down in the game. It doesn't usually go that way because something's going on. So when you are talking to your pitchers, and I'm hoping you have a little conversation with them as a group, maybe like, what's your number? Or let's talk about how we're going to have better bullpens. Let them know that they're in there to see how are they on that day. They're not machines. Let them remind them they're not machines. Remind them that you're going to have different moods, different variabilities, not to get down on themselves, but they need to know where they're at that day what pitches are working easily, and need to focus on bringing the pitches into the place or the location or the release point that they want. In other words, without judgment and emotion, oh, whoa, my changeup's not working today. Let me throw a few extra. 
No big deal, but that's what they're in there for. They're in that bullpen to get ready for the game. So that is, uh, so the not enough pitches is one of the things that I think is the biggest problem. The other problem is the pitcher's been sitting around and he doesn't even throw any flat ground throws before he actually starts pitching. So every pitcher should not take the mound right away if he's been sitting around. If he just played catch and he's doing his bullpen, that's different. But remember, they have to get their heat going and they have to have that that variation from flat ground to the hill is so important because the stride's different on the the flat ground. So it allows them to have a little more command with their arm and their body so that when they subject that motion to a longer stride and to a downhill trajectory, they aren't being shocked. Remember, we walk around flat. When you get on a hill, it's better if you're oriented to the ground first and then you take the hill. If you've been sitting and you just get on the hill, it doesn't work as well. So those are some of the biggest errors that I see uh, with bullpens. The other thing I see is, and I talk to my pitchers and, you know, I question them. And I've actually had fathers say to me, we try to save his arm for the weekend. They think they're doing a great thing for their kid to not let him throw bullpens. A pitcher cannot just face hitters. He has to have at least, and all my guys always get one bullpen in. And I work with tons of starters, and they have to get one bullpen in in between starts. And of course, you can't do that pen until you've calculated the pitches from the game. And most of my guys end up falling on a like a Saturday Wednesday pattern. If they're a starter on Saturday, usually they're recovered in three days. Their number might be at that level. And then they'll do their bullpen Wednesday or Thursday. And then depending on which day they do it, they'll do 39 pitches if it's one day to lay pitch again or whatever the number is for their pitch count. But they have to have that time to get in there and do what I call working technically. They have to look at their last performance. My changeup was a mess. Okay, let's focus on that in this bullpen. And in the bullpen, they need to be working technically and then give themselves some pitches where they're just pitching to see if their technical work paid off. But tell each pitcher, you're not going down there and just throwing. This is sort of a crazy thing I see. And I see this when they're playing catch as well. It's like they're not dialed into what they're doing. They think, oh, okay, I go do this and I get it done. They're not really conscientious of What did I just throw? Did it work? No, it didn't work. Okay, well, let me, let me like use my wrist a little more. Let me do this. They're not, they're not critiquing what they're doing in this technical pen. And I'm talking about it in an easy way. And when you're a coach, you know, you're letting them pitch and then you want to jump in with feedback, but you have to give the bullpen some intent and some objective, or you're not going to have pitchers that are improving as the season goes on. And if they're running their in-between bullpen like that, they're probably doing that before a game. And that could be the pitcher that has the most struggle for you. So these are just a few things, uh, different ways to look at the bullpen because most coaches are focused a lot on the game and you should be. Your plate is full with that. But these are things coming from someone who that's all I do all day long. And it's got so many things about it that could be useful to help you improve performance. So before I go on, Joe, does all that make sense too? It does make sense. I just have one quick question. When you say they should be going from do some flat ground before they go on the mound, is flat ground just playing catch or is flat ground playing catch and like going through the actual motion? Well, you know, uh, it's whatever the pitcher wants. Pitchers have their own style of doing things. Like I'll have pitchers because they they know they're in a session. They'll say, hey, do you want me to lift my knee when I'm playing catch here? And I'll say, do you usually lift your knee when you play catch? They'll go, yeah, all the time. I have pitchers that they don't just play catch with just standing there and, you know, stepping out and throwing like what would look like a slide step at 45 feet. I have pitchers that lift their knee on every throw they make, they start, but they're looking like they're going from the stretch. 
And then I have pitchers. So every pitcher gets warmed up in a certain way. Now, if you have a pitcher that needs to, let's say at the beginning of the practice, and so he's absolutely playing catch with the team or with his other pitchers, you've got a pitcher that needs to get his timing down with his leg or something with his knee lift, then you can ask him to do that. But pitchers usually have their own style with which they warm up. So I always work, I work with what the pitcher brings to me unless I see that what he's bringing isn't really good for him. All right. That makes sense. Okay. okay. Yeah. Now, one of the things I think this is a, a thing I want to say, and this is going to be uh, uh, an interesting thought, but I have pitchers that come to me injured and I have pitchers that come to me telling me they had bad performances. And somewhere in the story, sometimes they'll say, well, I had to get up and down three times that day. They were, they were sent down to warm up. Then they were held off. Then they sat down, then they were sent down again, and then they held off. And I think we've talked about this before in other ways, but coaches, if you if you sent someone down and then you didn't put them in, and especially if you've done it twice, and I know it happens because pitchers uh, are coming to me and they're either using this as the reason why their arm it feels weird now or they're using it to tell me how bad their performance was. So I do know it does happen with no fault of yours in the sense that I know how it must be trying to organize a rotation. You think you're starter, you got to pull them. I totally get it. But here's a little tip for you, because obviously, if you're sending someone down, that means you're at a place in the game where you need a new pitcher. If you need a new pitcher for whatever reason, you want him to be ready. If the pitcher, if you've had to send the same pitcher down more than once, you're better off picking a different middle relief guy or closer What if you've got one. Seriously, because that is a huge consideration for them and something that I think you want to know about. Because how many times do you have to put someone in and then they blow the game? And a lot of times it can be because of, you know, not them not having enough preparation in the bullpen, them having to get warmed up and then sit down. So that's just a little bit of thing to think about that you may not always be able to do. But if you get in that bind, you might go, oh, I've had him jump up three times now. Oh, I got this other guy. Let me use him right now. And that would be a better thing for the game performance than taking a pitcher. It's like having him do three bullpens. And, you know, and I don't care how many pitches he threw, getting ready and having to stop a few times is not good on the arm. So that's just one more tip for how to think about, you know, when you're sending guys down. Well, I I know what every coach is thinking right now. And they're saying, Angel, yeah, that's that's a great, great in uh, theory. But in reality, it's sometimes a difficult. Exactly difficult task because it's, you know, you're, you're in the heat of the game and you want to win a game and right. you want the guy that you want in there. And if he's just warmed up two or three times, well, you know, that's, that's part of the thing. Exactly. And, and that's why I, I of course had, had that caveat in there. And when you do put him in and let's say all of a sudden, you know, he's not performing, just make mental notes. In fact, all this stuff about bullpen, start making mental notes on your pitchers. Now, this this is scrimmage time. You're all doing inner squads, et cetera. If you're a high school team, if you're, you know, college, you're already playing. But start making mental notes of your starters that are having bad first innings. Start making mental notes of how many innings you're getting out of pitchers before they start showing signs of fatigue. When you are starting to see fatigue in a starter, that means he hasn't gone high enough in his bullpens to have the conditioning of his arm. See, my guys are conditioned to 79 pitches before their season even, before practices even start, because that means that they are then going to be ready to throw in a game. And once you get to that number, you're able to go even higher. But if you have only been conditioned to 45, 50 pitches, So start paying attention now because it'll tell you the kind of cleanup work you have to do before your games start or the cleanup work you've got to get in with that pitcher. So start noticing how their first innings are. Start noticing how their 
how long they, they last before they show signs of fatigue. I mean, if it's in the seventh inning, uh, that's ex- expected. But if you're getting three and four innings and they're showing signs, uh, that's a problem because it, it will only get worse. And then the other thing is when you do have to do some things, like you might have a pitcher that go, he's a workhorse. I can send him up to warm up and sit down. And he's ready no matter what. And it is true. Some guys can do that. But if you have a, if some things have come up and you see a guy doesn't perform well in that circumstance, well, think about the decision you're making because obviously you want to win games. So yes. And you know, when we teach, we, you have to teach ideals so that when you are not doing what's ideal and you're in a situation where, whoa, I, there's nothing else I can do. I, I had to send him. He had to sit down. When you know, and this is why the pitcher has to also know his warm-up number, when you have knowledge, you have power. If as a pitcher, he's down, he needs 25, 28 pitches, which by the way is the average, let's say let's say your starter gets hurt in the first inning or something's wrong. He starts giving you that eye like something's wrong. You send another starter down. If that starter, if you've had conversation with your pitchers about guys, know what you need to warm up for two reasons. One is you'll be warmed up then. But two, if you don't get the warm up number that you need, when you take the hill and you are like 16 pitches into a, your warm up and you got put in the game, and that's one of those things the coach couldn't control, for that pitcher to know that he wasn't, he didn't have the time to thoroughly warm up. He is in a much more powerful position than the pitcher who never knows how much he's warmed up, doesn't know anything about a number, doesn't know how it affects him. And then he's not doing well and he's taking a beating mentally because he has no idea why is this happening? Why can't I locate the pitcher that understands, okay, I got pulled from my warm up. So, all right. That knowledge is just power for him. I'm not going to say something might happen differently, but for him to know that is important. For you to know, uh oh, I just sent this guy up and down three times. For you to know that is power rather than you're sitting there in a neutral way and you have no idea what's going on. So, knowledge is power. That's why I always give both sides of it. And the more you know, sometimes in some situations, you might be able to make a better decision. This may be obvious from everything that you've been talking about today, but um, I would suggest to coaches that are coaching teams, count everything that, that a pitcher is throwing in a bullpen, have, have somebody counting how many pitches that he's throwing and, and keep records of this. Uh, the guys that I used to coach will tell you that every time they picked up a ball, someone was counting oh, how yeah. many times they threw it. And we, and we kept all kinds of records. And, and this was back in the old days when all we had was pencil and paper. I'm sure there's apps or whatever that can make it easier. And there's always a few guys that are just hanging around, not throwing that day or, or a reserve catcher that's just hanging around. Everybody's involved in the game. Somebody can be counting how many throws or how many pitches are happening in the bullpen. And then, you know, then you can take a look at, you know, after the game, the day after and say, oh, wow, you know, the reliever came in and he didn't pitch so well. He only had uh, six warm up pitches before he brought him in, or oh geez, I didn't realize we had him up three times and he threw a total of yeah, you know, fifty one pitches in the bullpen. No wonder he blew it when we came in the game. And then you know this this way you have something, you know, quantifiable that you can rely on. And believe me, I'm not a numbers guy, but I was counting every time that ball was thrown. Well, you have to, yes. So the way that I do it, so first of all, the app is called the catcher. Right. <laughs> The catcher counts all the, uh, my pitchers don't, even when they're doing flat ground and they're in between bullpens, um, you know, when they're home now in the off season and we're working to get them ready, my pitchers like to have some sense of how much they've thrown flat ground. So we're always counting. That's the catcher's job. And you know what? My catchers can call balls and strikes, keep control over if it's uh, three outs and also tell me what pitch count it is. In fact, there's a joke because a lot of catchers want to work for me because they make good money. And the catchers say, yeah, he asked me, what skills do I need to have to work for Angel? And says, you better know how to count. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's a big joke. So absolutely. And when a pitcher doesn't know his magic number, this is how I do it. I say, okay, 
the catcher and the catcher yells out when he's at 12. And by the way, I need to know where the bullpen is at because I might be wanting to do filming based on early pitches versus late. It's a very cool way to uh, analyze film. You know, what changes does he make? My catcher, I, I tell him we're throwing 39 pitches. We're throwing 59 every five. So every five, he yells out five. And I go, thank you. And if I don't say thank you, he yells it again. And the pitcher knows where he's at. And, you know, my pitchers, I'll hear them say to the catcher, hey, where am I at? I mean, they are so, because it, it gives them a guideline as to where they should be. And then he yells out when they're at 12. And then I say, okay, start mixing in your pitches. So I'll say, what do you think your warm-up number is? This is to a pitcher where he doesn't know. He says, um, 20. I go, okay. So at 12, start mixing in your other pitches. So at 20, I go up to him and I go, so if I'm the coach and you've got all the time in the world and I say to you, are you ready to come in? Are you ready to go in and face a hitter? He goes, uh, no, I need like three or four more. And it's funny. They always know exactly how many more they need. And sometimes they'll say, oh, I think I need 26 pitches. And then at 22, they'll look up and say, Angel, it's 22. And I, I actually am ready to go in. Okay. So for now, that's your magic number. And you always get to have a deviation in it if you need more. But that's the number that you go into that bullpen. And when they're framing it, when they're framing that whole thing, like, okay, this is what it is, then their bullpen starts to take on a tangible nature. And I think that's the whole thing I'm trying to say. Let's make the bullpen something you can bite your teeth into on a number of levels. And you know, when the pitch counts get high, and I've said this before, I don't let a guy just throw. I mean, if he's throwing more than 39 pitches, we're doing it in an innings format. So we're going to throw warm up pen number, take a break. Then we go back and I go, okay, you got 12 pitches. We break it into 12s because the guys go, yeah, I want to not have an inning with more 12. Okay. So we break it into 12 pitches. He comes off the mound. On other days, we're going, okay, first hitter, call balls and strikes, and he's actually working to get three outs. So we're, I'm always making them take their skill and put it into something that matches something they're doing so that they're getting more bang for their buck. And that's how we handle that. We handle the bullpen. So anyway, so I hope you guys get some great ideas. I know a lot of you already know all this stuff, but um, I thought this was worth talking about. So I hope you feel the same way. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And just one little tidbit, because again, I know that the reality is that there are coaches out there who don't have premium catchers that they're paying to catch their pitchers. And I know this is a pitching podcast, but the catcher in me just has to bring this out. Every once in a while, you'll have catchers who need to work on their skills. So if they're catching a pitcher and you want them focused on, you know, working on their catching skills, then get someone else to do the counting and everything else. I'm just throwing that in there. Yes, that's a great, that's a great point. Anyway, I think this was absolutely fabulous. Probably one of our, one of our more important podcasts of the winter. I mean, this was, this was a really good one and a, a great one to set up our preseason. So Angel, thank you so much for all this fantastic information. Oh, well, you're so welcome. And thanks. Thank you to everybody for listening. All right. And thank you, Joe. Oh, I've, geez. I just turned on the microphone. <laughs> what do I do here? <laughs> Way more than you know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You know, if you enjoyed the show, please be sure to visit Angel's website. It's gymscience.com. And that's Jim as in G-Y-M, not J-I-M. So it's G-Y-M-S-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. Go there and learn more about Angel and what she does and how maybe she can help you. And also you can get some great products. And one thing's for sure, go get that elbow book if you haven't gotten it yet. And uh, for those of you who have listened before, there may still be a discount. Just send an, send an email to uh, angel at gymscience.com. Also send an email to Angel if you have any questions for a future show. And we will be back in about three weeks for preseason session number two. In the meantime, we wish you safe and effective performance on the pitching mound. <laughs>